As you're probably aware, after this next season, the NHL will have a 30-second team joining the league. And as you also are probably aware, I do have what you might call a vested interest in that particular team. With that new team will also come a new fan base, many of whom will be new fans to the game in its entirety. So I've decided to put together a few videos that kind of help get new fans up to speed with the game of hockey. And so I'm going to start off today with this video explaining, at least at a high level, how positions, rosters, and lines work in the game of hockey. And no, I don't mean lines on the ice, that will be for a separate video. This time we're talking about player lines. And if you're still confused by what I mean by that, I guess you're just going to have to stick around. <laughs> By the way, if you are new to this channel and you find yourself enjoying this video at any point and you like to enjoy things, then the subscribe button can make sure you get to do some more of that in the future. Also, as this video will be a part of a series of videos geared towards newer fans to NHL, if you happen to be one of those and you have any other questions about the game, feel free to leave those down in the comment section below and I'll be sure to try to answer them as best I can, or I might just do a video on them later. Now, as far as today's video is concerned, there's no better place to start than with the positions in the NHL. And if you happen to watch any of my videos about the history of the game, you'll know that like most sports, the early years of the game of hockey saw a lot of different ideas of what positions should look like in the game, with different teams and different leagues having different ideas about how many players should be on the ice at any given time and what position those players should play, anywhere from usually nine to seven players, with really the only constant being that they all had a goalie. But by the time the NHL rolled around anyway, at least as far as professional hockey is concerned, we had the same six player teams that we see today, with five skaters and a goalie. Now as far as those five skaters are concerned, they're broken up into two groups, defensemen and forwards with two of the five being defense and three of the five being forwards. With the two defensemen, their main role is, well, to play defense. And while, like basketball, hockey is a fluid game, which means that all five of the skaters will have to play at least some amount of defense while the opposing team has the puck, it is mainly the responsibility of those two guys to make sure that the opposing team doesn't get off any easy shots, and especially doesn't get between them and their goalie with the puck. And when their team's on offense, these are usually the guys that you'll see hanging back towards the top of the offensive zone and on the sides, making sure that no pucks get past that blue line, as well as passing the puck back and forth to maintain possession and occasionally firing off a slap shot or two. But of course, as is the case with any one of the five skating positions, the exact role of each player depends a lot on the team's game plan and the skills of that player and the purpose of that line. And again, we'll get to what I mean by lines here in just a little bit. Now, as far as the other three positions go with the three forwards, there is a little bit more difference between those three roles than there is with the two defensemen, with those three being the right wing, the left wing, and the center. Now again, I do want to emphasize that this is just going to be a general high-level view of what each of these three positions is, and so there is going to be a lot of variance that you'll see from player to player and team to team as far as the exact role that each position fills. Again, in general, most forwards can play any one of the three forward positions, but most players do have their primary role that they usually stick to, at least on that team. That being said, it still is not particularly uncommon to see especially a right or left winger maybe play on the other side, though typically right wingers you will see be right-handed shots and left wingers are typically left-handed shots, with the handedness being determined by which hand is lower down on the stick and therefore which side of the body the blade of the stick is on. And you will also fairly commonly see centers potentially play on the wing of a separate line, especially on the power play, or even occasionally see a particularly skilled winger take over the center position of a lower line. Now again, typically the role of the forwards is to create scoring opportunities in basically any way they can. Whether that's working their way up the ice by passing the puck back and forth, getting on a breakaway, potentially even from a pass by a defenseman, or by standing in front of the net trying to obstruct the goalie's view and occasionally redirect a shot into the goal, making it harder for the goalie to predict where the puck's going to be when it does get to him. Now because of the nature of any one of the three forward positions, these are typically going to be the most skilled and fastest skaters on a given team with specifically the centers being the strongest and fastest among them. And that's because without getting too much into it, the center position has the most territory to cover and the most responsibility typically of any player on the team. And as a result, while all positions do have their stars in the NFL, the biggest stars do tend to be centers. And one of the most important positions for any team to find is a star first line center. And while we're on the subject, although I'm not going to go over face-offs too much right now, the center is usually the guy that will be handling the face-off for any team. That being said though, there are plenty of people that would argue, and potentially rightly so, that it's the sixth position that is the most important on the ice, that being the goalie. Now as far as the goalie's role is concerned, well, that's pretty straightforward, he just has to stop pucks from getting in the net. And sure, there is more to the position than just that, but as far as we're concerned for now, that's pretty much it. The only other thing you should probably know is that goalies are definitely usually the weirdest players on the team. And I mean, to be fair, I suppose it kind of makes sense that they are the way they are because, well, these are guys that are signing up to have a frozen chunk of rubber shot at 100 miles an hour at them anywhere from 20 to 30 times a night. 
on average. And if a goalie's, let's just say, unique personality doesn't always come through in their interviews or any other public facing way, you can usually see it in their equipment as they do have the most unique equipment of pretty much any other position anywhere in sports. Which is a fact about hockey goalies that from their pads to their glove to especially their helmet, they're not likely to let you forget. Looking at you, Darren Brown. So now that you have at least some idea of what the different positions on a hockey team are, and at least some idea of what the different roles of those positions can be, let's go over what the roster sizes look like in the NHL, and how many of each of those positions each team carries. For the majority of the typical NHL season, and I say typical because last season certainly wasn't, or at least it didn't end that way anyway, the roster size for each team is anywhere from 20 to 23 players. And as far as why a team wouldn't have 23 and go to the max, well, that usually comes down to salary cap issues. Regardless of where any team is in that 20 to 23 range, though, they can only dress 20 of those players when it comes to game time. Beyond those 20 to 23 players on the starting roster, NHL teams can also have up to 50 players under contract between their major and minor leagues, as well as then also having some past that up to 90 that have rights reserved, whether that's draft picks that haven't signed or anything else. But as far as those 20 players that you see take the ice any given night, those are made up of six defensemen, 12 forwards, and two goalies. Typically anyway. Occasionally teams will go with seven defensemen and 11 forwards, but it's usually 6-12. Now if for some reason you're into doing quick math, you might have noticed that with six defensemen and 12 forwards, and two defensemen and three forwards on the ice at any given time, that means that there's more sets of forwards than there are pairs of defensemen. And that brings us to the last part of today's video in lines. Now you'll know if you've ever been skating before that it is a very tiring activity. And this is something that stays very true, especially when it's in the context of hockey and regardless of how much a player's played or what level they're playing at. This means that especially in a pretty constantly moving game like hockey, players do need fairly frequent breaks. And so if you've ever watched a hockey game before, you've probably noticed that there are pretty frequent substitutions that are made with players coming on and off the bench. And even though it might look like it sometimes, those substitutions are not done at random. And that is where the role of lines comes in. Now most of the time that you'll hear people talking about lines, they'll be talking about the forward lines. Lines 1 through 4. And each of those four forward lines has their own center, left wing, and right wing, as well as their own role in the strategy of the team. Now again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this is going to be pretty generalized but each of those lines does have a pretty typical role that it fits in each team. The first line is the main scoring line. This is the line that is made up of three of, if not the three best players, or at least three best skaters on the team. And again, it's usually the center of this line that is your star player, your Sidney Crosby's or Connor McDavid's. Occasionally you will have a star player that prefers to be on the wing like Alexander Ovechkin, but it is usually the center. The second line is usually the secondary scoring line, which has largely the same job of the first line, but with players that aren't quite at the same level as some of those first line players. With some exceptions, like when a team has a second elite center, they will sometimes put him on the second line rather than being a wing on the first line, like what the Oilers do with Leon Dreisaitl. And sometimes to make up for that difference in offensive firepower between the first and second line, the second line usually does have some players that are at least a little bit more defensive minded and a little bit better on the defensive end. The third line of forwards is where things tend to get a little bit different, with this line usually fitting the role of the checking line. This is the line that isn't going to have quite the offensive firepower of the first or second line, but is going to be a little bit more defensive minded and is going to be much more physical than either of those lines. Now, don't take that the wrong way. That doesn't mean that team's third lines can't put up points. After all, we saw the Tampa Bay Lightning's third line often be the difference on the scoreboard in their run to the Stanley Cup in 2020. But again, typically the role of a team's third line is usually to face off against the imposing team's first or sometimes second line to try and slow them a little bit down by again being as physical as they can. And that just leaves the fourth line. Now this line can serve any number of purposes and it largely depends on what the makeup of the rest of the team is or just kind of what the strategy of the team is in general. If a team's trying to be much more physical, it could be another checking line. Or if they need help on defense, maybe it's a line of defensively minded forwards. But regardless of what the fourth line is asked to do on the ice by any given team, it's usually made up of roughly the same type of player. Players that are kind of on the bubble of the NHL, whether they're trying to make their first break into the NHL, or if they're players that are a little bit older and kind of on the way out. Obviously, generally speaking, still very much NHL level players, but still somewhat on that bubble. And if you do happen to be watching this video because you're a future Kraken fan, then it is in that third and fourth lines that the Kraken are likely to be a little bit better, if not noticeably better, than the average NHL team. Which does mean that Kraken fans might be able to expect to see their fourth line a little bit more than the average team would, with usually the fourth line not quite seeing the amount of ice time that the other three lines do, with specifically the first line usually seeing the most ice time. On the defensive side, there are just three lines, which usually tend to match up with the first through third lines on the offensive side, 
with the first defensive line being a little bit more offensively minded down to the third line being very much defensively minded and probably not going to have a whole lot of offensive impact. But again, since there's four offensive lines and three defensive lines, which are usually just called pairs, they don't always match up perfectly. This is also usually when you see a team go for a change while the action is still happening. You'll either see a full offensive line go for a change or a defensive pair go for a change and not both at the same time. But line changes is another thing for another time. Now, before we wrap this up, there still are two other kinds of lines that you'll see during the course of a game, the power play team and the penalty kill team. With the power play team being the team that's on the ice with a man advantage as the opposing team tries to kill a penalty. And the penalty kill team being the opposite that has a man disadvantage as your team serves a penalty. Now again, the makeup of the power play and penalty kill teams does vary a lot team to team depending on the skill of the players and what abilities each player has. But generally, the power play team is just going to be your best scorers, which means it's usually your first line and first pair, with occasionally throwing in your second line center for one of the defensemen or maybe one of the wingers. Meanwhile, the penalty kill team is very much the opposite and is usually made up of two defenders and your two best defensive forwards, or sometimes times three defenders and your best defensive forward. And with that said, that will bring us to the end of this video. But like I said, time and time again, throughout the course of this video, each of these subjects has a lot more details and nuances to them that I just didn't have time and really didn't make sense to go over now. But I hope at least at some level, this helped explain to you some of the basics of the game of hockey as far as positions, rosters, and lines are concerned. If you do have any related or clarifying questions about anything in this video or just other questions about the game of hockey in general, do again leave those down in the comment section below and I'll be sure to answer them or maybe do a video on them later. Otherwise, I thank you very much for getting to this point in the video. If you did like it, hit that like button down below. If you really liked it, maybe even enjoyed it, do think about subscribing. Otherwise, stay safe out there and be good to each other. Peace.